Should we start? Sure. Hello, this is TCPM. So if you're not interested in TCP, you might want to go into a different room. Um, we have three chairs. Um, Michael Tuxen, Ian Sweat, and Yoshi Remote, as you can see. Um, next slide. So it's Monday, so you might not have seen the note. Well, please read it. And um, if you have any questions, you can contact us or any ID or so. Next slide. Um, thanks to Andrew for taking notes. Um, Andrew, are you here? I do not see Aaron. Okay, so I haven't asked for a backup note taker. Gori, would you be willing to do that? <laughs> as soon as, Gre as uh, Andrew comes in. Or you can go find Andrew. Gori, yes. Thank you very much. Yoshi is doing um, a JavaScript. If you uh, submit an internet draft in the future where you think this might be of interest to TCPM, please put TCPM in the name of it. Then we will see it and it's on our radar. Next slide. This is our agenda. We will do a working group status and rechartering discussion. I mean, maybe more an announcement of that in the verification. Um, we have three working group um, documents which are being discussed, ECN++, TCP accurate request, and uh, some implementation um, experience on EDO. And we have uh, three other items. One is, I would say, future work on updating the TCP congestion control and TCP ABC RFC. Um, there is... Um, work on using TLS in combination with TCP AO. TCP will then provide the key material for TCP AO and TCP fast window advance. Next slide. Any agenda bashing? I guess no. Okay. So this is the this is the the status. Um, since last IFTF we have RFC 9438 uh, being published. The Yang document, I think, is still in the editor queue. Um, the PRR document is in his, is, uh, oh, the document shepherd is Yoshi, and he will say something about it. Yeah. So I think from the Chua's viewpoint, I think this draft is uh, mostly ready. Uh, as far as you know, the last discussion between Yu Chen and the Chu, uh, Neil, uh, they are going to publish a new version and as a result of the discussion. So once they have updated a new version, I'm going to submit it I see That's the plan, unless there is no specific, you know, comment to stop proceeding. So that's the status from Trial's point of view. If you have any comments, let me know. Thank you, Yoshi. The next document, Accurate ECN, if you have looked at the first version of the agenda, the item was green, meaning that it is shipped to the AD at least. Um, now it's black um, because Marco sent an email this morning um, that his address, his comments are not addressed, as we know, and is, is rep will be reported in the Shepherd's write-up. Um, but he said that he will provide um, comments what needs to be changed concretely um, to address his comments uh, later today. So we are giving him this day to provide these uh, comments. I'll discuss tomorrow with Bob one, if that happened and what the output is, and either it goes to the AD as a current state, as it is in the current state, or we address his comments. We can still address his comments during AD review, during ISG review, but it would be better if we have resolved this uh, before it goes to the AD. That's why 
we delayed it or I delayed it by, by a day. Generalized ECN um, is something which is uh, next in the queue after we have shipped acute ECN. I think we will have a working group last call on generalized ECN. We have a presentation for that. Today, as you see, it's marked in blue. GCP EDO, we have some uh, implementation experience and a great request also. Um, as the AD mentioned, the deadlines are in the past, so it could be updated, but we haven't done that yet. Next slide. This is the rechartering. Uh, pretty, pretty simple. It's uh, Martin suggests to remove two paragraphs. This is the first one. Next slide. That's the second one. Um, and he will add, he wants to add a sentence that generic, uh, I mean, generally congestion control works goes to ICCRG or congestion control working group, um, but um, TCPM might be involved if there are TCP specific things, which in my view, makes sense. This suggestion was sent to, an, to the mailing list, I think, a couple of weeks ago. There was positive feedback, but um, Martin can say whatever he wants now, and you can provide feedback now, too. Yeah, I, if people have um, comments, you can, you can share them now. I, I think I set a deadline for the end of this meeting, so um, if you need to read and digest this, uh, please do it before by Friday, and then uh, in theory, as early as Saturday, I may submit this to the ISG for, for consideration uh, if there are no serious concerns. Thanks. So, Gori Fairhurst, this wasn't a serious concern. I was noting that the, we previously said SCTP and TCP would, M would have a special liaison. I think this has become a three-way <laughs> cooperation program now because there are certain things in the CTP which are very similar to TCP which probably need to be coordinated with you and we probably also have to coordinate with CCWG. Is that what the everybody here understands? If there are TCP-like bits in SCTP, which there are, then and they get changed, then we have to coordinate with TCPM. If there are congestion control bits, then we probably go to coordinate with CCWG. And we all talk to one another, so I don't really suggest the charter is changed in any way if we understand this. <laughs> uh, uh, one, one there just for future. Uh, please use the queue. But uh, oh. anyway, no, no, okay. keep going, Martin. Sorry. Right. That's pedantic. Yeah, I, I, I thought this was like my little session where I could just uh, talk. Um, uh, that, that was for all y'all, not, not, not just you, Martin. Um, I lost pretty thought. Oh, right. So uh, obviously coordination is good. Um, I didn't want to get too wordy here. No. Um, I mean, I, I think when it's cash control, literally the default should be CCWG, but there are always reasons where funny things happen and they end up in different places. And obviously if we're doing something that touches other things, we should coordinate with them. I think that's, your understanding is correct. Michael Tuxen from the floor, not knowing how to enter the queue with a foot client. Um, I think we shouldn't think too much about SCP here because um, if it's related to TCP in a similar way, we dealt with it in a single document. So this was a no brainer in the past. So I think we should, it's clear where to go, what to do. And um, we, we don't need to think about these sentences too long. No, All right, Bob Briscoe. Um, just for clarification, does this mean, or does it still mean that congestion control work, the preferred location for that will be in CCWG, if, even if it's got some TCP elements in it, TCP specific elements, and maybe we ought to say that somewhere, um, you know, rather than sort of, if it's got anything TCP specific, it has to be here, which you could interpret that as. Okay, yeah. Um, Yes, your your saying is correct. That is that is preferred, um, and this doesn't imply that. Um, yeah, the TCP specific bits can be in a CCWG document for sure. Like I think one 
we'll see what actually emerges one model for like a ccwg document is like a whole bunch of algorithm and then like little subsections in tcp you do x and so, you know here's an option and you know here's a quick transport parameter here's a you know or whatever um but it's just whatever's easier document wise Any other comments? If not, drop an email by Friday. Next slide. So this means we have the first presentation, Bob. Hi there. Um, this is going to be about um, generalized ECN draft or ECN++. The draft name will come up shortly. Yep. Should say, yeah, generalized yep. ECN. That's it. Um, draft number is 14, which was um, only uploaded uh, this morning. No, actually, it was half 12 local time. And uh, only has some very minor changes, but we've had two since the last ITF. Next slide. So I've, I've been asked to, as this is coming up for working group last call, I've been asked to give a bit of a um, retrospective on the whole draft, not just sort of latest changes. So the first four slides give that retrospective. Um, firstly, the motivation and um, the whole draft is about allowing ECN capability on TCP control packets, which was prohibited in uh, the original ECN spec in RFC 3168. And um, an example of that is having an ECN capable SYN, which is probably the most performance enhancing um, modification. And you can see on that plot there of um, the flow completion time with and without ECN um, plus plus this one's Without, you get those um, one second timeouts where the SYN gets lost. Um, could be less than that if the RTO timeout is less, but um, one second is recommended. And um, with ECN++, you don't see any of that. It's all down in the dots at the bottom. Um, and you get um, similar things um, with the other control packets. Um, that was, this is just a very quick recap. Next. So this is the full set of control packets that RFC 3168 says should not be ECN capable. You can see in the, in the second column there, RFC 3168, apart from data, everything is not ECT, not ECN capable transport. Um, and then um, this draft is the next three columns and it depends whether accurate ECN has been negotiated or not for two of them, that is the SYN and the Pure Act, um, where if it has not been negotiated, you still can't put ECN capable on it. Um, and then the last column gives the congestion response. I'm not gonna go into the congestion response um, now, but that's on, on this slide for the record. And this is a copy of a table that's in the, in the draft. Um, the reason for not being able to put ECN capable on SYN or pure ACK, um, unless you've negotiated accurate ECN, is that you don't have any feedback of what is on that packet um, unless you have accurate ECN feedback, because RFC 3168 feedback doesn't give you that. Um, however, a little footnote too um, says that it can be either accurate ECN negotiated or some other safety me measure. I think Michael Scharf suggested you could just set your congestion, um, your, initial, your initial window to one, and that would be safe enough um, as, another, as, as an alternative if you were not using accurate ECN, if you were just using 3168. <clears throat> um, and finally, just to be clear, ECN++, which is the name of the, um, the protocol in the draft name is generalized ECN. It's an experimental draft. And although it says you can set ECT on all these, you don't have to, to do the experiment. You could, you could select different ones and see what happens individually. You don't, you know, you don't have to go the whole 
hog to do it. And we may find that one of them doesn't work and the others do, and then the result of the experiment will be that we don't do that one, but we do all the others. Yeah. OK, next. Um, so the draft is in um, three main parts, at least the specification part of the draft. Section 3.1, which, um, so section 3.2 was, was the previous slide. And then there's also section, um, section 3.1 and 3.3, which cover what middle boxes do and what receivers do. So the, the sender was the previous slide. Um, what middle boxes do, like firewalls, this draft doesn't actually say, it just repeats what IFC 8311 said, which was an update to 3168, which is a proposed standard update, not just an experimental one. And it essentially said, this, this um, experiment is coming up. We don't see any reason um, why middle boxes should discard these packets if they do have ECN on them. And so you should not discard them if you're a firewall or whatever. There isn't actually any evidence that firewalls are doing that, but um, we're making it clear. And, or at least as clear as it can be to find one RFC in 9,000 or something and, and find the right one for a firewall developer. <coughs> right. Um, so then um, for the receiver, the question is, if you're an RFC 3168 receiver, what do you do if you receive an ECN capable control packet? Um, when you weren't expecting anyone to send you one. And um, the, the answer is, in this draft, it says you should accept it. Um, and if you're an ECN capable sender, who's, who's an ECN plus plus sender, then you definitely must accept it because you're sending those sort of things as well. Um, so, and then the, the bulleted section there tells you the specifics of each one, which I'm not gonna go into just cover the table for this recap. And obviously the draft gives you more specific specifics. Next. Um, and finally, for this recap, before I get into the latest changes, um, there's a section after the specification that gives all the rationale for what's been specified. And most of it is about rebutting arguments in RFC 3168 for why you should not make these control packets ECN capable with substitute arguments for why you should, right? And um, I won't go into all those because they're all very specific to each case and that's why the draft is quite long because um, the spec itself is quite short but then all the rationale is long. Um, the main two arguments that it knocks down from RFC 3061, 3168 are the reliability argument and the argument about DOS attacks. So I will go into those as a, as a recap. Um, and certainly if anyone is wanting to review this draft, I would like to encourage you to review some of the reasoning, not just check whether the spec is correct and see if you agree with this reasoning. So the first one is that um, the original ECN spec 3168 said, you must not set ECT on a packet if loss of that a CE mark on that packet would be detected as an indication of congestion. So that assumes that something upstream of the loss has marked its CE, and then later on in the path, something else has dropped it, right? <clears throat> and so it's saying, don't mark it ECN capable so that it might get a CE mark if later on it might get lost, and then you wouldn't be able to detect that you had a CE mark. But in a lot of cases with these control packets, you can't tell whether the control packet was lost either. So you can't see the indication of congestion due to a loss either. So it's sort of a bit... Uh, um, I don't know what the word is, um, but purist to say, well, you mustn't set ECT on something that might not be seen when you couldn't see it anyway. So um, the argument put forward here is more a do no extra harm argument that um, you can put ECN capable on something if um, it's better because it's ECN capable, even if you can't detect that it was lost. Okay, and the second argument about DOS attacks um, was that you shouldn't put ECN capable on packets um, if it might help an attacker strengthen their attack. And again, this is a, a bit backwards in that um, 
you're telling someone in an RFC not to do is do something that will strengthen their attack. But of course, an attacker doesn't have to do what it says in RFCs. So um, what you're actually ending up doing is telling good actors not to do something which bad actors will still do, and then the good actors don't get the benefit. So <clears throat> um, they, it's better to allow the good actors to get the benefit and then have the protections against the bad actors in the network and in uh, receivers. And we already have those protections in AQMs and in, in, in TCP receivers. So that's, that's the argument there. Next. Right. Um, so the recent changes, I've split them into technical and editorial. A um, couple of slides on technical first. Um, we had an additional check for duplicate acknowledgement. Um, and the next slide explains this in much greater detail. We've just added the words um, for all detection al duplicate detection algorithms because previously it implied it was just for the um, lost um, for loss detection um, or for you know, deeming whether there's been a loss. Um, I'll, I'll say more about that on the next slide. Um, the there was a lot of informative text about no sorry there's a, a little bit of informative text about other transport protocols and how they might want to use this approach. Um, one being SCTP, you know, um, we've just been mentioning it mirrors a lot of what's in TCP. And um, just recently, Ron Stewart updated that draft. So the description in this draft uh, um, now says, um, it still mirrors what RFC 3168 said, whereas before it essentially said it was just a long expired draft because it's, it's hasn't been updated for, I don't know, some, I think it was more than a decade before it was just updated, right? And finally, I was going through checking that I'd covered everything that had ever been said on the mailing list about this. And um, I found an email from Michael Scharf that I hadn't dealt with, um, which mentioned that we should put in the um, security considerations that um, if you have different um, ECN capable control packets in different implementations, it might make fingerprinting easier. So I just added that as a statement in the security considerations. And whether you want fingerprinting or not is up to you. I got Jackson from the floor. Just clarifying the SDB stuff. So <clears throat> I just submitted the the old document formatted in XML to um, with no content changes. So it reflects the very old uh, state. Whether it still makes sense or not is a different thing. The, the point is that um, there is some interest to do work on ECN with SCTP because it's used in WebRTC and um, then you can uh, make use of that. So in the future, it will um, provide an appropriate way of using e of, of doing ECM with SCTP. Right now, it reflects what, what was there 10 years ago or whatever. Okay, so would you rather we just didn't say anything? If this goes to RFC when you're halfway through doing that, would you rather it just didn't say anything about that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I tried to press this button. <laughs> I believe you're great. Thank you. Oh, you did. Yeah. It worked. Right. I don't know. Um, yes, Bob, please do what Michael said um, as TSBWG chair. We <laughs> don't, don't discuss the history of this old one, but you can still refer to the SCTP based spec as not currently defining it and say that this, uh, there's working progress to do something. Yes. But I won't talk about the content. Yeah, yeah don't talk yeah. about the content being out of date because it won't be out of date soon. Okay. So I'll probably change that. If we're going to go to working group last call, I'll just quickly change that and do another rev. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this was the slide I promised about um, Marku's concerns. So as background, it's about uh, acknowledging acknowledgements. And um, the, the problem is that when you've got ECN capable pure acts, um, we have um, ECN feedback that could allow those to be acknowledged, 
um, in certain cases, one being shown on this slide. Um, so you get an ACK of an ACK. And then anything that is looking for DUPACs might find that that's a DUPAC if, if some data has already been sent in the other direction. So in this, the case of this slide, you've got sort of a sender sending everything in one direction, the red axe, uh, the, the path is all congested. That's why they're all red, not black. And then um, just as those um, red acts start to get act, the direction of data switches and you start getting data from B to A. And then um, those acts of acts look like they could be dupacks. So the way we dealt with this was the accurate ESEN spec says you um, have to send occasional acts when you're getting a lot of congestion marking on acts, which is where those asterisks are on, on A. Um, but it doesn't say anything more than that bit there in courier font. Any spec that allows ECN capable pure acts must require measures to distinguish acts of acts from dupacs. And ECN++ is such a spec. So that um, gives three conditions for setting those pure act, uh, setting the ECT on those pure acts. It must have successfully negotiated SAC must have successfully negotiated accurate ECN, and it must apply a check for the DUPAC on incoming pure acts um, in all its algorithms that says, if there isn't any SAC on it, despite SAC have, having been negotiated, it's not counted as a DUPAC. Right, so it's all quite complicated, but it only applies to the host that's originally sending those, because that's the one that might get confused with what it receives. And that's why all that doesn't have to be in the Accurate ECN spec, it only has to be in the spec where you're sending the ECN capable pure acts. Now, um, Marcus just emailed as, as, as you heard this morning, <clears throat> and his case seems to be now, um, although he's promising more information later today, um, holding us all on a knife edge, um, that uh, <laughs> absence of a SAC might be due to A supporting SAC, but not DSAC. All right, so you've got SAC at RFC 2018, is it? Am I right? Could be. Yeah. And then DSAC was like RFC 2090 something, I think. So like a few months after that, and then you've got fast forward, I don't know, 25 years or something, an accurate ECN. So you, you, the possibility is you've got something that supports SAC, but not DSAC and supports accurate ECN. So I think it's getting a bit tenuous, but we'll hear what he has to say. Um, and um, Richard doesn't think there would even be a problem if that were the case, but we don't exactly know what the problem is until we're told exactly what the problem is. Um, so we'll see what happens at the end of the day. Next. Um, just a couple of editorial changes. We had numerous places where this draft was originally written before the update, the standards update to RFC 3168. Um, that allowed um, ECN capable um, control packets if an experimental draft were written about it. And so we had a number of cases where th this draft was still saying um, these things are prohibited by RFC 3168 without mentioning that they were now allowed by RFC 8311. So fixed all that and other inconsistencies where parts of the draft were summarizing other parts and hadn't been updated and things like that. Yeah, and that's it. Other than we are definitely ready for working group last call. This draft has been hanging around until accurate ECN has completed working group last call. So yeah, looking for reviewers now. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. So, any volunteers for reviewing? Volunteers for reviewing. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, you can. Thank you. Martin, do Google. Uh, I, I'm. Uh, so, to be clear, Marku's whole thing is about this, not accurate ECN. Well. We well, it's about X of X. Okay. Whether we can deal with it only in ECN++, we know tomorrow morning, I hope. Okay. So it's related to both documents. All right. It, thanks. The, the, the text that he's written is about 
this draft, ECN++, but it's in a, in a thread with the subject line accurate ECN. Okay. All right. Um, and, and he promised to make concrete proposals how to address his issues. So when we see the proposal, proposals, we, need, we, we know whether this is something which need to go into accurate ECN or ECN++, but okay. we don't know. I'm happy, I've waited a long time for ECN. I'm happy to wait another 12 hours, but um, I, I'm, I'm, it's good to know that this sounds like more of an ECN++ problem than a, yeah, because that's frankly high, less priority than. We, we share your opinion. Anyone else willing to review ECN++? There are a number of people involved in LPRES that I don't see in the room, so maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, can if, if you don't show up, yeah, at least one from Apple. <laughs> and Stuart is not here. He, he just thought just on, on purpose. <laughs> no. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's willing. Thank you. Anyone else? Since waiting seems to be a concept. Okay, then thank you again. And next one is um, Charles. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Carlos Gomez and I'm going to present the last update of the draft entitled TCP ACK rate request TAR option. My author is John Crocroft from the University of Cambridge. Next, please. So, uh, first of all, a quick uh, look at the motivation for the draft. Delayed DAX is a widely used mechanism which is intended to reduce protocol overhead. However, it may also contribute to suboptimal performance in some scenarios, such as so-called large congestion window scenarios, meaning a congestion window size much greater than the MSS, where saving more than one of every two acts may help improve performance, and so-called small congestion window scenarios, meaning a congestion window size up to the order of one MSS, where delayed acts may incur too much delay, uh, may limit congestion window growth, and so on. Thanks. So uh, this is the main option format, uh, where the R field carries the ACK rate, which is requested by the sender, with currently a maximum value of 127. And there's the special case of R equal to 0, which indicates a request of an immediate ACK while keeping the steady state ACK rate. Next. Thank you. So on the status of the draft, uh, it was adopted in February. So today I'm presenting version 03. And um, it aims to address the comments received from the last ITF meeting. And also it incorporates feedback from quick act frequency draft authors. Thanks for the comments and feedback. And now let's go through the updates. So the first updates are in section 3.1 entitled sender behavior. So we have first updated one paragraph uh, with just a couple of minor updates, which are shown in red. So to give the whole context, uh, the paragraph reads as a TCP sender must not communicate a value of R corresponding to an amount of data bytes to be acknowledged at once by the receiver greater than the last known receiver window size or greater than the current congestion window size. So here the uh, focus was trying to make it explicit that we refer to the latest uh, values for these variables. Then we have also added a couple of sentences in the context of mentioning the use of R equal to zero, where we state that requesting an immediate ACK from the receiver can help reduce the time it takes to detect and or recover from packet loss. Next, please. <clears throat> So uh, then in section 3.2, receiver behavior, we have updated one paragraph. Uh, this is after a comment by Christian to emphasize the autonomy of the receiver to transmit an ACK. So uh, the updates in this paragraph are in red. So now it reads as following the behavior specified in RFC 5681 in order to aid the sender in segment loss detection and repair. A TAR option capable receiver should send a duplicate ACK immediately when an out of order segment arrives. And that is regardless of the ACK rate requested by the sender. 
Also, we have added uh, another paragraph, uh, also following 5681, that the TAR option capable receiver should send an immediate act when the incoming segment fills in all or part of a gap in the sequence space, and that's also regardless of the act rate requested by the sender. And still in the same section, we have also added explicitly that in any case, as specified in RFC 9293, the delay for an act must be less than 0 0.5 seconds. So this is to make it explicit that the maximum delay for an act still holds. Next, please. Then uh, we have also a couple of minor updates in section 5.3 entitled lower frequency of RTT samples. Um, so this is in section five, which focuses on stretch acts, which may happen when TAR is used with a large value of R. So uh, we have updated one paragraph and we have extracted the, the main part that we have modified with the updates actually shown in red here. So uh, what we state here now is that in order to limit this issue, meaning the lower frequency of RTT samples as a consequence of stretch acts, we've added that when there are segments in flight, a sender needs to trigger a sufficient number of acts per round trip. In the previous versions, instead of round trip, it was RTT. By the way, thanks a lot to Ian for helping uh, double checking the paragraph and helping wordsmith the text. Finally, there are also some updates in section six, which is entitled changing the act rate during the lifetime of a TCP connection. So the new content is in red as well here. So we explained already in the previous versions that the sender may notice that the exit receives cover more segments than the act rate requested. This may be for two reasons. One of them was already explained in the section. Uh, perhaps act decimation is occurring en route. So if the sender knows or suspects that uh, that's what's happening, it may want to reduce the act frequency to reduce the receiver workload and network load up to the act decimation point. However, there may be a second reason, which is the receiver using large receive offload. Uh, if the receiver, sorry, if the sender knows or suspects that this is what's going on, perhaps it may want to increase the ACK frequency to compensate for the impact of LRO on the flow of ACKs. So, um, yeah, I think there's Lori in the queue. Yeah, actually, that's it. So, this was the last slide. Thank you. So, Gori Fair has. Um... Okay, uh, firstly, why, uh, why, why four? Why is four a magic number for the number of RTTs you can wait for feedback from the remote end? No. I mean, I, I, I get one as an example, but why is four in the document? What, where does four come from? Yeah, I think you mean if, if you go back a couple of, well, one slide. It's in the text yeah, rather it's, than it's the, the slide. text after this one. In, it's yeah, in the document. It says one to yeah. four in the document. Yeah, yeah so uh, the Text after this one states something like um, this number of acts per round trip uh, depends on the scenario with the best currently known value uh, between one and four. Yes. Uh, and that was an attempt to summarize the discussion that happened in the quick uh, working group one or two ITF meetings ago. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if perhaps it can be improved or just keep it to. I think one is a common denominator there. I don't know. Okay, uh, all right. We, we can't grind the same, same thing in two working groups. But uh, one, one is clearly a, a common way of closing a feedback loop, which you get feedback typically once per RTT. I accept that it doesn't have to be. Um, four is a bigger number. Um, I don't know that waiting for four RTTs to respond to an event is a safe way of doing it or not, but you might have in information. If you do, then it would be good to kind of add something here. I don't like the word significance, and I like the extra text, but the extra text was also not very clear. So I, I just maybe we can hack a little bit more on it, um, perhaps, or you can say more. Yeah, so uh, about number four, I didn't have uh, information from myself. Actually, I was trying to summarize what different participants in the Greek working group had. Yeah. List, a list discussion, I think, rather than no. Well, uh, great. A clarification question. I think this might be a case where you were intending to write one to four acts per round trip. 
Oh, okay. Yes, well, yes. Yes. Ah, uh, ah, right, um, right, okay. So, 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 so that's I think also just capture, I think, what was talked about in quick. So, uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, so sure. let, 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 let's, let's look at the text carefully and discuss on list differences. So I think this might be an editorial comment, but okay, that's why I was like, I'm pretty sure you're on the same page, but, oh, okay. but if there's a slight, <laughs> but it might mean that there's editorial work to be done. So thank you, Barry. Can I do a very quick other question? Um, this Arwin thing is interesting. So you've got flow control with flow credit in quick kind of influencing your decisions, but this can change at any time. And you've got like, I don't send a update to change the act frequency because the Arwin was this, but then that Arwin can just change later. Is that, I mean, is flow credit really part of the story in deciding whether to change to a particular number? I don't, I don't know, but I'm interested. So tell me a story. Well, um... Or do it on the list because yeah, you can always say that. Yeah, perhaps. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, maybe let's move it to the list. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, search for it. And while searching, go to the mic. Okay. Um, Martin Seyman has put an um, issue into the quick working group, which is relevant to this. Um, I was just trying to find the number of it, but I couldn't find it. Um, and I think the, the more general point for your draft, which also applies to the quick act rate draft, is that there are a number of specifications that say when an act should be triggered. And this draft needs to say whether it overrides those or whether they override it. You know, the, <laughs> Like accurate ECN, for instance, it, it's got sentences on, you know, a C mark will trigger an ACK or the quick transport says a C mark will or certain delayed ACK, you know, even going back to RFC 1122, you know, the, the, um, you know, there are certain things that say an ACK will be triggered. Yeah, so, so yeah. in the latest version, actually, we've done a few updates uh, in that direction, basically to show, to say that this document is not overriding the previous specifications in that regard. Okay. But yeah, perhaps yeah. we might need to go further and double check that everything is yeah, that, correct. That's going to yeah. need quite a, quite a wide spread of um, looking around at possible places. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, thank you. So the next is a remote presenter for EDO implementation. So we run the slides here, just say when we need to go to the next slide. We can't hear you. Sounds like you're going to hear me. Yep. Okay, okay, let's start, let's start. Uh, hi, uh, hi, everyone, everyone. Uh, uh, we, can you hear? Can you use a, so we have a, a huge echo. So can you use? Huge, huge. Oops. Turn off your loudspeaker or use a headset. One, 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 uh, how about it? this can you speak something no oh, that, that is much better okay sounds good okay let's get started yeah perfect uh, thank you okay uh hello everyone i'm kunyuki uh working for aws uh i recently implemented this video on the top of the latest linux tree 
with the help of Yoshu Nishida. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to talk about what's ADO and what changes were needed in Linux and feedback to draft. Next slide. Oh, and the next slide. <laughs> and this behavior is formatted as shown in the diagram and the data set and the field, uh, data set field and options are the main topic uh, today. And the data set is four bit fields and indicate the number of 32 bit words in the header. This limit the header size to 60 bytes and the basic header occupies 20 bytes. So we can use up TCP options up to 40 bytes. And the 40 bytes are increasingly becoming a limitation and some combination options are not allowed in a single connection like MPTCP and TCP AO. To overcome the limitation, there is ongoing work to extend the space. Next slide. And that is the EDO suggested by Joe Touch and Wes Seti since 2014. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. And EDO has two types of option, EDO supported and EDO extension. EDO supported is exchanging SYN and SYNAC to negotiate EDO capability. And then EDO extension is used in all the following segments to override data set. And it has two variants, I'll explain here. Yeah, thank you. And EDO is used only after successful negotiation. For example, EDO is not supported by a server and EDO supported is not in SYNAC. And then client will fall back to non-EDO connection. And if EDO extension is not included in SYNAC, uh, in, not included in the ACL through a handshake, then the server will fall back to non-EDO mode. This could happen if the return path is asymmetric and the middle box strips are no option from the server. And next slide. And each option looks like this. And EDO supported is two byte or four byte if experimental ID is used. And EDO extension has two variants, as I mentioned. Both variants have header length field that indicate the header length in bytes and overlay the data set. So we can use options up to allow about MSS. And this option must occur in the area indicated by the data set option. The Runga variant has segment length field, which has IP payload length to detect merge and split of EDO packets. And if the field does not match with the actual length of the packet, the packet must be discarded. Next slide. Let's say a single EDO packet is split into two packets with no constellation of EDO, for example, by generic segmentation of road or middle box. Then the second packet has the same TCP header with the first one, meaning the following area has extended options. So the user data could be parsed as TCP options, so which should not occur. In this case, the Runga variant should be used to detect the split and drop the corrupted packets. Next slide. And the same things can be said to the uh, function that merges two packets into one. So for example, GLO or middle box. And in this case, we can use the segment length. Otherwise, the extended options could be act and also pass it to the user space. The next slide. And the next slide. Yep. Uh, here are the prototypes of EDO. I implemented with Linux and packet Dolly, and Yoshi implemented the TCP dump. And the next slide. And this is a uh, user API in the Linux. So the EDO is disabled by default, and we can enable it with syscontrol or setsocket. And if you set one, the shoulder variant is used and you can set two for the longer variant. And the next slide. And I also added the debug syscontrol knob to insert uh, arbitrary knobs after EDO extension. And the next slide. Yeah, here's a brief demo. So first we, uh, we set the EDO to two to use the longer variant and set 32 to the knob syscontrol knob to insert 32 knobs after EDU extension. 
and the Python script just create a single connection and send a message hello over the connection. And the next slide. And this is output of the normal TCP dump. So the sequence number or length is wrong. So I had to check. So, so if uh, with normal TCP dump, we need to check this uh, hex dump. And the next slide. And this is the output of Yoshi's TCP dump. So, seeing any CNAC has the ADO supported, and the arc of the three handshake has the ADO extension, and also 32 knobs. And the following knob is following two knobs is the to align the TCP timestamp options. So the header is 72 bytes in total, and it's in the header length field. And the next uh, push and uh, push packet. Oh, sorry, I'll go back to the slide. Uh, so, and uh, the fourth packet, in the fourth packet, the length is five. So the message hello is included in the packet. And then the segment length is 72. Next slide. Here I'll explain the notable changes in the Linux. So, when TCP stacks in the packet, the renewal buffer is allocated for each packet and its length is fixed. And the length assumes TCP header is less than 60 bytes. So if the options are more than 40 bytes, the buffer must be reallocated and this could add some overhead. And the next thing is related to the receiver side. And when TCP stack processes an incoming packet, it pulls TCP header into a linear buffer and holds two pointers that point to TCP header and IP header. And then when EDO extension is parsed, we need to pull more data into the linear buffer. And that changes the layout of the linear buffer. So the cola, uh, so the after parsing TCP options, the colas need to reload TCP IP header pointers. And the third thing is the, about the data set usage. So basically we need to inspect all data set uses and collect it if needed. For example, IP is based, uh, sent based on the sequence number and the data set. If EDO is enabled on the connection, uh, we must send ACK based on the EDO extension. And, and our example is MD5 TCP AO and MT, MPTCP. For example, MD5 hashes user data, and it means MD5 also has to consider EDO extension to fetch user data collectively. And the next slide. And in TCP stack, there is some functionality that could Merge and split EDO packets. Also, that could skip uh, TCP option passing. So, then we need to disable such a fast processing. TCP calls and could merge EDO packets, and a header prediction could avoid TCP option passing, and that could result in the corrupted packet. And, and the same thing can be set to the GSO and the GLO. So for now, GSO is disabled when EDO is negotiated successfully. This is easy. And GLO is disabled by passing options for now. And this is not acceptable approach. So, and another approach would be click GLO with not, so that two consecutive packets will have different uh, TCP header, for example, like, to nth packet will have a layout like EDO extension, knob knob, and the next packet will have knob knob EDO extension. And uh, Ian Sweat, Google, just one clarifying question. Um, is the intent that at some point you'll, this is a temporary problem or is this a long term problem that GRO and GSO are disabled when? EDO is negotiated successfully. Yes, this is uh, 
yes, this is short term fix. So if video is wide split, we uh, use the wide split and then we can support GRO and GSO in the future, I think. Okay, okay. That's, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly. Thanks. And go to the next slide. So regarding to the performance, I tested my patch set with IPAR3 on two computing nodes in AWS. So then I didn't see regression after applying patches, but if video is enabled, there are some overhead. And when I tested it with localhost, then there were actually some overhead, but it was negligible on the real connection between two nodes. Uh, Michael Jackson from the floor. The baseline is without LRO. Uh, sorry? The baseline measurement you did is without LRO and all these. Uh, yes, things. the baseline is without my patch trees and a normal TCP connection without EDO. OK. And could you go to the next slide? OK, here I will give two feedback to the Collins draft. Next slide. First, I suggest adding this, this sentence to the draft. Now, EDU extension must occur in the earlier indicated by data of set, but the number of extension, EDU extension is not limited. So now we can use multiple EDO extension like this, and which works quite malicious. And this kind of usage just complicates validation. And I didn't think, I don't think of a valid and a reasonable use case of this. And next slide. And the next is related to fallback mechanism. In the current draft, it's noted that ADU extension may be used only if confirmed. And the server side, we always need to consider the case where ADU extension is not included in the final arc of through a handshake due to asymmetric pass, as mentioned before. But the sentence sounds like when you not send ADU extension after receiving ADU supported in CNAC at the client side. So when does that happen and what triggers that situation? So I have no idea. And next slide. And it's painful related to crossing. So and in Renux, CN receive is split to two states, TCP new and receive and TCP receive. And TCP new and receive is used to process uh, passive fast open connection and cross sync and a sort of connect cases. The problem here is TCP news and receive and TCP established share the same function to pass TCP options. So supporting fallback for cross sync is expensive because it has a code in the hot parts that is, that could be true only once for the arc of the three behind check. So next slide. So the, I think the uh, sentence should be applied only to the passive connection. And I would add the orange sentence to simplify implementation. So a client must be enabled after receiving it as supported in CNAC. As a chair, I just wanted to that technically we've run out of time. I, I think we could maybe go a little bit longer, but like there are quite a number of slides left. I'm not sure if there are things that ah, you yeah. want to make. The next to slide is the rest. Longer. OK. I see, yes, this is the first slide. So it's okay. Yes, backup slides. Oh, sorry. sorry. I apologize. I didn't realize half the other the remaining slides were backup slides. You, you yes, very sir. well done. This. You, well done. Sorry. Thank you. Martin? I promise you I'll give you back time in my segment. Um, I'm going to take like 90 seconds instead of 10 minutes. Um, Let's see. Th thanks for coming to present this um, and doing this work. Like I I've been curious about this for actually more than two decades, <laughs> and, and, uh, and someone's actually done it. So that's great. Um, are you are you motivated by any particular use cases um, in this work? Um, because I I've been curious about like what I mean. I understand that like these op options are proliferating, but 
I'm also, but I also think about use cases like, is it a use case that must have this or that would, or is it nice to have? Because if it must have it and you like fail the negotiation, you just like can't connect. So I like, do you have anything in mind? Or are you just doing this to, to see how it would work? Uh, so we don't have a specific use, uh, use case for now, but I see, uh, some workers that could, so I, I see I saw some uh, design document in the in AWS that could uh, use more than four device options. See, uh, mm. okay. So yeah, it's um, nice to have nice to have for that. Okay, sounds great. Um, my other question is, uh, did you observe any of that? So did did you run this over the over the open internet? And if so, did you observe any of this um, bad middle box behavior where it's letting the option through and then chopping up the packet as you as you had on that slide? Uh, I haven't run this on the internet, so we haven't observed the middle box behavior now. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yoshi is next. Okay, uh, can I speak up? So, yeah, so yeah, this is obviously good to have, but uh, if you think about you know, using AO and MPTCP at the same time, and then most likely we need to use this option. And also, there might be a use case that you, know, you want to return many SAC blocks for some reason. And then in such cases, you know, this option also can be useful. Yeah, just yeah, that's that's great because that that sounds like a nice to have because you could always fail over to not MP. I mean, you would have to have AO presumably in any real use case if, but you could fail to not MPTCP and just have the shorter stack blocks if this failed. So that's that's great. Thanks. Um, welcome back. I was wondering how this long options will influence the windowing uh, in in TCP. Are there any? I'm, didn't find any discussions of uh, the influence of the long options uh, to the initial window or subsequent windows. Sorry, sorry could you? Uh... So we have a large portion of the packet is option. Is it counted to the window or not? Or how is it handled? So maybe there should be some text. So the question is the the extended options could be counted as window size or not? If it's counted or not, I, I, I don't know. Uh, from ah, yes, uh, it's not counted, I think. Maybe a sentence for that In, into the draft would be nice. Thank question. you, Matt. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, I am aware of one class of middle boxes which does resegment. And that is certain NATs that are rewriting payload and unencrypted connections. If you insert bytes because you, for instance, changed an ASCII IP address, an example might this might be the uh, old FTP control channel. It's possible that the middle box needs to resegment. If you want to look to see if these kinds of devices are common, I'd, these. Obviously, this, this case is only an unencrypted case, so it may not be common anymore. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, I was going to open. and we'll, we'll thanks, Colin. Um, it might be worth adding something about security considerations for extraordinarily long, large extended options. Because um, like, if it's, yeah, anyway. Just... And uh, Yoshi? can I? Up. Okay, thank you. So can I speak up as a chair? So I think EDO draft has been around for a long time. And then uh, one of the discussion uh, of this draft was lack of presentation. And then also the interaction with the GSO or GRO. And then in this presentation, uh, we have implementation. And then we are way to disable, automatically disable GSO or GRO. So, so in deploying this code is 
I, I think it's okay for the internet from my point of view. And then I'm now wondering what will be the broker to proceed with your draft. If there is any opinion I would like to hear. What I, would like to see, what I would like to see is that the feedback um, which you, the, the feedback on the internet draft which was provided in this presentation is given to the authors, which I okay. think are not participating today. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can discuss on the mailing list. Yeah, I mean, give the feedback also on the mailing list that the authors are aware of this. Mm -hmm. Gori has not taken. Who is going to summarize the feedback and ask the editors to do something? Is it going to be the chairs who send an email to encourage people to do No, I, I was asking the presenters to provide the information, not only in a presentation here, but also on the mailing list, such that the, the authors are aware of this feedback. Very clear. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I will send feedback to the authors in the mailing list. Perfect. Thank you. So, Martin. Save as much time. Save as much time as possible. Oh, no problem. So I had slides. They've been completely overcome with events. Um, every every uh, three ITFs, we complain about some combination of RFC fifty six eighty one, which is like, of course, like the core TCP address control and loss recovery document at this point, which is uh, four thousand RFCs ago, and um, and thirty four sixty five, which is so appropriate bite counting and is experimental, which is crazy um, at this <laughs> point because it's not experimental. Uh, so the development is that um, uh, I, I, looking back at ITF 112, um, uh, Lars Eggert, uh, you know, obviously the current chair, but long-term TCP Emmer, had offered to co-edit uh, 5681 BIS, which would cover all these problems. And like that just kind of went, went in the memory hole for a while. But I just was chatting with him, and uh, he's gain he's stepping down his chair soon, uh, in March, and uh, is willing to give it another go. But he needs a co-editor, so um, this is a call for like somebody who wants a little bit of the glory of co-editing fifty six eighty one, um, and and you know we can chop that up into different documents as we want. I guess we could. Well, that's a whole other conversation. But um, I, this is, I mean, first of all, does anyone even like? Can I see a show of hands? Anyone who's like, gee, I would like really think about doing that? Or in the queue? No takers? OK, I, I hate to be stillborn on this again, because uh, I did have slides threatening to just do a 3465 this if no one stepped up, because um, that's what I kind of wanted to do. But all right, well, let's please think about it. Um, I will keep nagging until something happens. And or, well. I guess I can have one more meeting to do that as AD, but <laughs> but I will I will nag and a then lot. Then your and, time window opens up. Yeah, and you will get spam. <laughs> you will get spam in the TCPM list until somebody steps up. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very short present. Uh, I mean, talk. Um, we have uh, TCPAO with TCPM. Um, so hello, I'm, I'm uh, Maxime Pirot from UC Louvain. Um, I'm going to present uh, our draft, which is uh, joint work with Olivier Bonaventure and uh, Thomas Wirge and my colleagues. Next slide, please. So um, the context of this work is um, uh, just a short summary first of what TCPAO is. Um, so TCPAO is an extension that provides integrity protection and authenticity to uh, TCP packets. And as the current uh, documents define it, um, the cryptographic keys that provides this protection, they're set up out of band. Um, and so what we saw is that when a TLS session is used on top of TCP, there is an opportunity to derive uh, those keys from the TLS handshake and kind of uh, help the deployment of uh, CPAO. So this draft is really proposing a way to achieve this. Next slide. So 
what, um, let's go over an example of use first. So um, what happens is when the connection, when the TCP connection starts, it uses a default key uh, that is specified in the ID. So the default key doesn't really provide any sort of form of protection, but it exercises the fact that TCPAO can go through in this connection. So they first start with a default um, uh, MKT. Next slide. And then in the TLS handshake, we, um, um, we propose to add a new extension to negotiate the AO protection. So there is a couple things to negotiate. Uh, there's a couple options in, uh, in uh, TCPO. So whether TCP options are protected by the, um, uh, by the extension or not, uh, there is obviously the authentication algorithm to negotiate and the KDF to use. So all that is happening during the TLS uh, handshake. Next slide. And then when the handshake succeeds, the server can, uh, in its responses, uh, the server can um, already announce that it has prepared the MKT. And then, so on the, on the last segment here, we have the uh, next ID of the keys that is using those secure MKTs that we derived from the TLS handshake. Next slide. And then when the TLS handshake really is really finished, they, go, they can use those secret keys and they, they are secure keys to protect and verify uh, both packets. Uh, I mean, packets going both ways. Okay, next slide. So um, we, our use case is also BGP um, in the same way that TCPAO also uh, included BGP as one of their use case. Um, we're also working on uh, using TLS at top of BGP. That is my colleague Tomada is working on this more specifically. Um, but what we foresee and what we would also like to hear from us is that um, in this mode, any long-lived TCP connection that is using TLS can benefit from TCPAO. And so this could work for uh, HTTPS, but also uh, for uh, DNS over TCP or DNS over anything that is using TCP um, that could benefit from, uh, from this, uh, this work. And obviously, from just from the conversation we had about EDO, maybe it's also a way to uh, uh, to help deploy EDO by improve, by uh, making it easier to deploy uh, TCPAO as well. Next slide, please. Um, the document is very. This is the initial version of the document. There is many more things we could uh, we could do. One of the obvious things is that we will need to discuss this within TLS. But first, we wanted to hear from the TCP users and maintainers whether this is something that they are interested in. Um, but we need to discuss interactions with other TCP extensions. So there is TCP fast open. Uh, there could also be MPTCP. Um, the size of the options, I mean, TCPAO and MPTCP, could, there could be some conflict there, of course. Um, but then there is also this interaction with TLS mechanisms, such as RTT and pre shared keys, but those will happen in TLS, um, of course. And then there is um, one thing we didn't um, specify or propose a way for is that you're expected to renew the secure keys at some point um, to do some kind of key updates of when you have really long lived connection and you need to renew those keys. This is not done in, doc in the document. This is something, of course, we have to, to work for. This was, I think my last slide, it's a very short presentation, but so, just so you, you got the idea. Thank you, any questions? Uh, Yoshi. Graph or uh, if server server support this key, but uh, they don't have an extension in TLS. In this case, what will happen? So, so you mean a, a partial failure? Um... That's right. So, so the, the TCP handshake goes well, you can inch exchange uh, TCPAO, but then something fails in the TLS. I, I didn't get that part, sorry. Uh, if the, you know, the server doesn't support TCPAO TLS oh. extension, what will happen? Oh, um, so, um, I think in this case, it, it shouldn't enable TCPAO, uh, but there, 
if, if we want to support that use case, we need some form of acknowledgements within the TLS extension negotiation to handle that. That is something we didn't think about yet, but I think it's solvable if I understood correctly. Okay. At least you need, your draft need to you know, clarify this point, this use case, this, uh, okay. this event. Understood, yeah. Yep. Michael Thank Jackson you. From the um, what's the interaction of the uh, TCP IOS key stuff with uh, TCP, uh, TLS key updates? Um, so um, in the draft, we propose to derive a new secret from the master secret and the key updates they do not update the master secret. So we are in a completely different space. And um, when the TLS does key updates, it updates, um, it, it's part of the secret that has been derived from the master secret. So there is no um, clear interaction. Uh, one thing we're aware of and that we don't want to, uh, we think it's a, it's a good idea would be to, if you sync the TCPAO key updates with the TLS key updates, you reveal this, and maybe you're revealing something you, you, you probably want to hide uh, inside the encryption. But we, we need to um, uh, to work on this. But it, it, as, it, as if now, there is no impact of key updates. Key updates on the TLS level can still happen. It's just that at some point, you would want to renew the TCPAO keys. But you don't have a source for that yet. No, we don't, we don't propose a way now. Um, we'll, we'll still need to think about that. <laughs> yeah, just to, to mention, we have similar problems when we are talking about security over long living SCTP associations. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll look into that. Thank you. Any other questions or suggestions? Then thank you for the presentation. Thank you. And then we come to the to the last presentation, which is remote on TCP forward acknowledgement, uh, fast window advance. You have all the the remaining time, which is fourteen minutes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. Yeah, uh, I'm Tejeshwar, uh, and me along with other colleagues, Harshan Srinivas, working in Samsung. Uh, we had an uh, in-house development of uh, TCP and then uh, corresponding uh, upper layers like uh, IMS layers, which internally uses uh, SIP. And uh, SIP internally uses the TCP and UDP. And uh, TCP is the major choice for the uh, communication of the SIP uh, messages. Uh, yeah, ne next slide, please. Yeah, uh, uh, during a SIP, right, uh, the SIP has its own uh, session timer. Uh, let's say it, it uh, starts a TCP uh, uh, request, and then on top of the TCP connection, it, it sends one messages, its own uh, messages, example, SIP invite and uh, 200OK and uh, 100X. So it has its own session timer on top of the TCP uh, retention timer. But SIP timer is uh, configurable. It can be shorter than the uh, uh, TCP uh, timers. So what will happen in case of the SIP timers expires early? So when the SIP timers expires early, the application treats the, that as a session failure. Uh, and the application doesn't need any of the uh, previous data which is sent uh, early on the TCP connection. Yeah, in this case, the, the TCP has its own uh, retransmission timer, and uh, it's keep on retransmitting the, um, the previous pending data until the acknowledgment is received. So, uh, but uh, once we uh, receive acknowledgement after some time, the, the application simply discards the data, whatever is uh, transmitted uh, uh, or received from over the connection. So the application uh, continues to transmit a new session data uh, if the user makes a new, uh, different calls. So the uh, first problem here is uh, the, even when the application session timer uh, expires, TCP transmission timeout uh, transmission timer will not help the session to recover uh, fast or close the session. It will in, instead of that it adds the additional data to the network and uh, delays the further session establishment uh, issues in case of uh, where the application is maintaining the session timers for the session. 
So this issue percolates down to the TCP problem of uh, head of line block blocking also, where the TCP cannot process the re received data until there is a missing segment uh, uh, in the uh, uh, complete TCP buffer. So uh, TCP cannot proceed uh, further. So we have to address this issue also. Uh, uh, during our uh, SIP application session timeout because uh, the application session uh, like SIP invite uh, is segmented into multiple packets. If one of the packet is re uh, didn't received uh, in between the uh, TCP uh, uh, session uh, connection, the con complete uh, connection will be blocked. So uh, the the so uh, this head of line blocking problem also we have to solve in case of application uh, session getting timeout, and also the TCP congestion window uh, also get increases, um, uh, and uh, the congestion control algorithms also doesn't help uh, during uh, by uh, reducing the transmission time, uh, 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 transmission data, and also time. So this also adds the uh, TCP session problem. And uh, one of the uh, uh, suggestion which we had come from the earlier draft is use of the TCP user timeout option, where we have to, we can terminate the TCP connection if there is any after time of, timeout of the unacknowledgement data. This was the earlier draft on the TCP user timeout option. But uh, the, this doesn't help in a case of uh, SIP uh, application timers. Our uh, application session data because there are inherent uh, uh, connections which is established with a server, uh, and uh, because of the uh, uh, those issues, the TCP connection cannot be established immediately when you terminate uh, the connections. Uh, so these are the uh, um, uh, many problems uh, which occurred uh, for the uh, SIP application uh, session timeout. And we have a way to solve it uh, by in the TCP layer itself. So yeah, uh, next, next slide, please. So we had uh, introduced the new TCP uh, flag uh, called FWA in a TCP uh, flags. Uh, this uh, flag extension doesn't need any uh, negotiation with the network. And uh, we this flag uh, uh, is a bit, it uh, ensures that whenever the application want to flush the any of the data from both from the sender and receiver application can uh, set this bit uh, using a socket options and then uh, the when the uh, uh, tcp layer receives this fwa bit it can flush the any pending um, uh, buffer at the sender and receiver by sending uh, modifying the tcp sequence number uh, to the fwa sequence number uh, we'll see how the fwa sequence is uh, updated uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, this was the uh, second draft, uh, second version of the draft we had updated in September after the uh, previous comments from the previous draft. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, we had modified uh, TCP header as it indicated uh, in the uh, TCP reserved bit. And uh, this doesn't need any negotiation because if the receiver don't understand TCP FWA flag or in a middle box or any layer doesn't understand, it can simply ignore the uh, field and uh, the normal TCP operations will continue. If the uh, receiver understands that there is a FWA flag is set, the receiver can uh, see the received uh, sequence number and updates uh, its expected sequence number uh, with the uh, received sequence number from this and send the acknowledgement back to the sender. Once the sender receives the acknowledgement back uh, at the sender side, then only the sender can flush its uh, sender buffer uh, from its, uh, uh, from its uh, local buffer. And the receiver buffer can uh, flush only after receiving the, uh, uh, when it re receives the TCP FWA bit set at the receiver side. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, the in the for the FWA flag operation, uh, we have uh, uh, updated the TCP control block. Uh, we have uh, introduced the new uh, sequence number field uh, called uh, FWS, uh, called fast window sequence number, which will be set uh, to the maximum uh, uh, data sent from the TCP center block, center side. So when the uh, 
sender configures the uh, tcp fwp flag the uh, sender can set set it the uh, uh, sequence number uh, to the fwa sequence number so that uh, the receiver can receive the, the sequence number up to which he can flush its buffer and then send the acknowledgement back to the uh, sender so the so the so in this way there is no negotiation required and if the uh, receiver is not compatible uh, with the updated tcp option he can uh, is, uh, choose to ignore it or any of the middle boxes of rationals uh, yeah next next slide please and uh, we had uh, addressed the uh, issue in the mid, uh, middle boxes if the middle box uh, has a stateless um, box it can uh, sim uh, simply forward the sequence number if the middle box is modifying the sequence number in between we can uh, choose to update the sequence number according to the uh, mapped sequence number in between the uh, between the uh, two uh, between sender and receiver and uh, to address the tls case where uh, we had received comment on for a tls case uh, because we the sip operations uh, the ms we use uh, don't use the tls operations i i think we choose to we can uh, it is up to application when to apply the fwf fwf flag so that tls applications can ignore the fwf flag uh, but still we are discussing how uh, we can enable the uh, for the tls Uh, this FWA flag, and on the uh, uh, improvement point point of view, we see that good improvement in the good 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 put of the uh, TCP connection because we are uh, not transmitting the unnecessary segments to the uh, network when the when the uh, application doesn't need the uh, data anymore. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. And uh, we have given example in the. Uh, Uh, draft where how can you enable the tcp fwa bit uh, for the application it is just simply configuration whenever it want to um, flush the tcp e, e, data at the sender side but it doesn't guarantee that it is flushed from the uh, its buffer because it depends on the receiver side acknowledgement yeah next slide please yeah uh, we have received good amount of the comments for the first draft and we are looking for uh, any further improvements on the draft and uh, we also seek uh, further review on the draft yeah thank you and i are have any questions maybe you can just are there any questions hi can i go ahead Can I go ahead with my question? Yeah. All right. Uh, hi. So you just mentioned uh, that it will flush uh, all the data. Uh, at some cases, the endpoints like they may want to reinitiate after a SIP transaction, a uh, reinitiate a SIP transaction after a timeout. So then this flag will increase the uh, the time for the session establishment for the next sessions. So how would you handle that? yeah application it is application choice when it, it he want to flush the buffer uh, because the uh, that uh, sip e application want to reinitiate or uh, retransmit the same buffer uh, from the tcp level it can uh, retain you don't need to set the buffer but if application declares that the session is completely uh, timed out then only it can initiate the flush from the application side Okay, and this is kind of in a territory of inter interlayer protocol uh, communication, correct? Yeah, yes, it is. A, it is the intent of the application to flush the buffer. Okay, thanks, Igor. And um, hi, uh, I have a. Uh, two questions, so I'll just ask both of them. And um, so, first, um, in case of uh, head of line blocking and. I don't know about much about uh, your particular use case, but let's say for the bulk transmission, you're likely to have filled uh, the entire receive buffer. Uh, so if you want to do this operation, uh, you will at least have to spend one RTT uh, to clear the receive buffer so that you can transmit more. Uh, I think that's and uh, right. And this, uh, so I think just to make sure that I understood it correctly. Um, 
Now, second question is, how is it going to look for the user of, I mean, traditional TCP stream sockets uh, or the application that's using it on the receive side can't just use like a regular TCP receive. They need to like be relying on receive message. I mean, just what, what's the user experience, user interface for this like? Yeah, uh, for the first first uh, first question, it is, this yes, definitely needs one RTT to complete the uh, flushing between the receiver and sender. And uh, for the user, uh, it looks uh, similar. Uh, uh, the flush operations uh, will be triggered by the uh, TCP based on the uh, uh, when, if there is any unacknowledged data at the sender box, sender side. Uh, so uh, if the sender didn't receive the uh, acknowledgement, uh, possibly receiver also didn't receive the buffer uh, from the uh, from the sender. So uh, the uh, the interface looks uh, same. Yeah, it doesn't change uh, between the uh, receiving side also. Well, but the receiver is basically receiving a stream of bytes. Uh, yes. So now, uh, is the receiver is going to be even aware that receiver application that there is a gap between whatever it received last from the socket from the stream and like new data that's coming in that like supposedly at a very different offset. Uh, as far as the sender is concerned. Yes, uh, correct. A, a receiver, uh, at the TCP receiver side, he, he aware that there is a change in the sequence number, but the, for the uh, uh, user of the TCP receiver, like application of the TCP receiver, uh, he, he doesn't aware that there is a sequence number change uh, because uh, the sequence number is handled up to the TCP layer. The whatever is sent uh, to the receiver is after the sequence number. Okay, just want to make sure it's usable. But okay, thank you. Hi, Bob Briscoe. Um, got to think a bit more about whether there's any other way to do this. But um, just as a sort of picky point about ut utilizing a um, TCP flag for this. I think it'd be worth looking at other flags that wouldn't be would would be incompatible with this and putting them putting it together with them to make a code point instead of taking a whole flag for it. So, for instance, the urgent point pointer flag or the push flag, making them into a code point with this so that this is if this is set to one, it only means what it means if they're zero because they wouldn't be compatible. And then you've got more code points rather than burning a whole flag. Before doing this, I mean, that's an optimization. Before doing this, I think we should understand whether this makes, whether this no, is that's, useful. That's what I started out saying, I'm, you know, I'd have to think about whether this is useful, but if it, if it was. You know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we ran out of time. So thank you for the presentation. Um, I think we should continue discussing this on the list and uh anything else uh sorry matt for cutting you off um yeah no um i need to think about this more as well um i'm not sure about how to use this practice but i think that's it yeah so then we are closing the session and see you in brisbane Yeah, let's just protect it against exactly that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can do you can use detailers for that. Detailers over over TCP. That's the worst idea if you ever heard. heard. Um, <laughs> is this channel still open? Hi, Matt. Hello. I wish I was there. I wish you were too. Yep. Um. The, the question I want to ask about that, which may or may not be relevant at this point, is whether or not this is a workaround for using the socket buffers as part of the application. Oops, guess not.